Uh, as he said, my name is Ellen Friedman. I'm delighted to be here in Berlin, such a wonderful city, a little bit toasty, but still wonderful, and to be here for this 10th Buzzwords Conference. I've been here every year, I think except one, since 2011, thanks to Isabel, uh, who got me inspired for this con conference. And I've met just some amazing people that have led to a lot of other interesting uh, projects and conversations in my life. And I'm trying to recognize some of those other people in the audience. It's actually very hard to see you with the lights. Um, I uh, am a committer for two Apache projects, Apache Drill and Apache Mahout, and uh, sort of fitting uh, the conversations that you heard yesterday and, and uh, this morning, uh, I'm actually a committer who doesn't write code. I help build community and raise awareness for those projects. There are many roles for people in Apache, uh, but in addition to the very important one of writing code. and. I'm an example of somebody who's in, in, enjoyed uh, being able to contribute to the projects and those other roles. And I've also written a number of uh, books on topics related to this, short books mostly for O'Reilly, uh, a longer book uh, for Manning uh, called Mahout in Action. No slides yet? Okay. I'm going to start off and just say some of the things I want to talk to you about today are things that are really powerful techniques to make your machine learning projects work. Every different project obviously has different needs, but these are some that have very broad and general impact, and there's some of the things that can have the biggest impact on your project. Now, sometimes when you hear about uh, something like this, you want to hear the exciting latest sexy, complex algorithm and a huge new technique or a very fancy tool, and those things are all very good. But in fact, there are some very basic skills, really fundamental skills, that have, in some cases, the biggest impact on whether projects are a success. And these are not always the things that people most want to hear, uh, but in fact, they're often overlooked, say, in, in courses, and, and they're things that people learn kind of through experience, and those are some of the things that I want to share with with you today. Now, if we had the slides, you would see <laughs> a picture from a laboratory of people reaching down into uh, a very cold, deep freezer with their hands and gloves, pulling out blood samples. And I was going to start with that as a kind of unusual example of how people dealt with data, with the, the value that can be in data, how you have to store and protect data for long periods of time, and the importance of documenting what you've done so that you can go back later and deal with it. So this is a real world example, quite different than probably what most of you work on. Turns out there's a very large medical laboratory in Canada. I learned this recently from people at the University of Calgary. A very large medical laboratory, and they froze blood samples for years. I think something like 30 years. Uh, they took blood samples from patients. They did whatever tests were available at the time specifically for the analysis that they were doing. But they recognized that those blood samples combined with the patient history, with some knowledge of the outcome of that patient, have value that go beyond the project, the, the analysis that they were doing at the time but they didn't have the techniques to be able to release that value from the blood. The blood basically contained the data. It wasn't the blood molecules itself, they were disease markers that were in blood. And so they froze them, preserved them, very well documented so that somebody years later could go back to that sample, use it, find the data in the sample, and be able to understand what happened. And it turns out this actually did happen. Years later, with modern genetic techniques, they were go be able to go out back and look for disease markers, match those up with outcomes, and it's just a wealth of information. And the reason I wanted to share that kind of unusual example with you is it's not unlike what all of you face as you work with data. And it's something, it's, you have a lot of what you have to think about to get your current project done, but if you think about the fact that data contains knowledge, basically information, that you or somebody else may want in the future, in some cases for very different projects, maybe different techniques develop, and you want to be able to go back to that data. So the ability to store essentially raw data, raw data that retains a lot of its features before you've processed it down to your current uh, project, to treat that data almost with the status of having data in production, even long before code is written, is kind of an analogy to what they did with the 
the blood samples. But also keep in mind, even having the foresight to save those blood samples for so long and be able to go back to them with modern techniques, if they hadn't documented what each sample represented, what the outcome of the patient was, and so forth, very, very well, it would have had very little value because they wouldn't be able to understand in context what that data means. And the same thing applies to whatever you're doing if you're building a recommendation system to sell things, uh, some sort of an analysis system to do predictive maintenance on IoT data, uh, security, fraud analysis, whatever it is, deep learning, whatever it is that you're building machine learning for, it's really important to preserve data, protect it well, even before that the code is finished, document it in such a way that you can go back to it, or that somebody else can go back to it. And there are other issues I want to talk about, but that's probably the singus, single biggest one that people overlook until it's too late. Later, when you say, oh, we could have looked at this feature, but we've now thrown that away, or it's been processed away, it's too late to do anything about that. Now, a lot of the stories that I want to tell you today, and these beautiful slides that I've developed for you today, are based not just on my own experience, but on stories I've heard uh, over the years from a number of different data scientists. And particularly, I had a lot of input on this talk for two data scientists, uh, Joe Blue, and Ted Dunning, both of whom are data scientists and experts at uh, MapR Technologies, and both of whom have worked together in previous companies as well. Between them, collectively, I think they have something like about 35 years of experience building various kinds of machine learning systems, and the good thing is that you can learn from their experience. You don't have to spend 25 or 35 years redoing some of the mistakes that they did in order to learn what they now know. So there's a lot of practical real-world experience that applies to things as well. So a starting point for this is to consider, has anybody here actually participated in a Kaggle contest? A few of you. How many people here have worked with machine learning before? Ooh, OK, a much bigger part of the audience than I expected. Can you do your presentation on the stick? Sure. I could do my presentation uh, uh, on Just a... Move it on the stick. Right, okay. So is this... We have to use this computer. That's why we have to copy uh, your presentation on the USB stick. Or do you have them on any stick? I have it on a stick. It's down there. Do you want yeah, It's down there? Yeah. yeah. Just hand me my purse and... Wow. <laughs> I'm not sure these slides were worth it. We're going to go through the slides really fast when we get them up and going. So I sat at breakfast with Lars and we talked over some of the uh, horror stories of things that can happen right at the beginning of a presentation when something goes wrong with the slides. I think that was a bad idea. <laughs> I'm just saying for future reference, don't do that. That's <laughs> don't do that. Uh, okay, where was I? Yes, Kaggle contest. Uh, those are terrific contests. It gives people a, a great incentive to compete, uh, to learn about new algorithms, especially to tune their own skills in terms of tuning algorithms. But they're quite different than the real world. For one thing, you're usually given the question as opposed to figuring it out yourself. You're given training data. You may have to decide which features to use to extract from that training data. But the training data has been cleaned up, focused, prepared to be appropriate as training data in most cases, and the real world is not quite so kind to you. So basically what you're having to do in real world projects is to prepare your own Kaggle contest for yourself, and that is a whole lot of work. Now, uh, again, when we get the slides up, <laughs> I'll show you an image that actually came out of a Google paper making the point that there's a lot of technical debt. Are we? Not yet, okay a lot of technical debt and doing machine learning uh, because it isn't just the model and the learning process itself. It's this massive amount of logistics around it, how you handle model deployment, how you handle data preparation, and, ooh, this is so exciting. Hello, my name is Ellen. <laughs> uh, let's see if I can get the clickers. This is my contact information. I'll repeat it at the end. 
When people tell you the, well, the basic things that can make a big difference, it's kind of like, you know, I need to lose weight, I want to be healthier, I want to find some fancy diet or fancy technique, and sometimes the right advice is, I should just try eating less and exercising. <laughs> Not always what you want to hear, and in fact, Those things can be very, very powerful, but it doesn't mean that they're easy to do. And I have to say, with regard to eating less, there are some real barriers to that, and some of those barriers are found right here in Berlin, okay? So I'm doing my best to get past that barrier, but back to machine learning, what makes it work? Well, a big part of what makes it lurk, work, or lurk, <laughs> work, is the data, and I just want to remind people, I thought there might be some real beginners in the audience, and in case there are, but when you're talking to somebody, even if you're experienced, help them understand that the data is a key part of how you build a model. The data is actually part of what builds the model. And this isn't a single process. You don't just write it, run and done. It's something you're going to do over again, evaluate, tweak, and go back through. You're often developing the training data, holding out some data for testing, going back through that cycle more than one time. What we're going to talk about today, in the past, uh, as I said, the machine learning bit is that little red bit in the middle. That, that's the actual model, the learning process. And it's a really small part of this huge process. It's an excellent paper about technical debt and machine learning systems that came out from Google some years ago. But in past presentations, I've talked more about the things on the right. How do you handle the, the model deployment, the model evaluation, and so forth. And today, I want to focus more on the things on the left that focus on data itself, data collection, data verification, feature extraction especially. That's a big part of this process. So there are really three areas related to data that I want to talk about. These aren't the only things you need to do, but there's some that have a huge impact, and there are some that sometimes are kind of glossed over, especially in courses. One is, what is the data you're working with? And is it really what you think it is? Or is it really what somebody else told you it is? You really have to verify it. Do you know what features you want to build? And once you decide what features you want to build, how are you going to go about building them? And the last one, ooh, and apparently moving to another uh, system kind of uh, did some interesting things to the slides. But the last one is this idea of once you've done all that work and all that preparation, do you know what you've done? We'll whip through this because this was my story about the, the blood samples, which you don't need to hear again. These are the people I referred to. By the way, Ted uh, is a huge fan of buzzwords. This is the first time he's missed it since 2011. He had some meetings and things going on in California. It was very sad not to be here, but says hello to all of you. Kaggle versus the real world. As I said, real world is not so, quite so clean and neat as Kaggle. And in the real world, you're doing the work that somebody else did for you before the Kaggle contest. Now, in that first topic of is data what you really think it is, Verify data, absolutely verify it. Go in, look at it, make sure it's what you think you recorded. If somebody else told you what it is, make sure that you understood what they said correctly and make sure that they weren't making a mistake about it. Ask a lot of questions. Another aspect of that early stage of looking at data is to explore it. And what I mean by that, I mean, you've already explored it some just to make sure it is whatever somebody told you it was, but You go in with some assumptions about data. Obviously, you wouldn't be using uh, uh, that data set if you didn't already have some a priori idea of what features you want to build. But there may be other value in that that you want to use as well that you will find by literally just examining the data. And in some cases, that's examining it via various tools. In other cases, it's examining it just as visual Uh, examination or draw yourself a picture and see what comes out from that. And there can be some really valuable surprises that come out. So taking a moment for that early data exploration is a really important thing to do. One reason I mentioned Apache Drill as a great tool to do that, Drill is a SQL uh, engine, a SQL query engine that works on very large distributed uh, data sets. It is it, quite efficient. Other things are also quite efficient. But Drill is extremely unusual in the flexibility that it offers. It discovers schema on the fly. 
And so that makes it very appropriate for this exploration piece because you don't have to do a lot of data prep before you start asking questions about the data. If you had to spend hours and days and weeks preparing, it kind of defeats the purpose of jumping in to see what you have. And Drill is just a classic tool for, for making that work. So when this first idea of Verify, I said I was going to tell you some real-world stories that came from some of these data experts. And this story actually happened. Uh, this one, I think, came from Ted. Uh, not I don't, it may have been Joe, but I think it was Ted. Uh, years ago, he was working for a company called ID Analytics. He was building a fraud, credit card uh, fraud detection system. And uh, he was given data from a large financial institution. Ted used a column that they lab labeled fraud, thinking these were fraud events. That makes sense. And he built his model based on that. And he knew you need to verify data, so he even talked to the customer ahead of time and said, this is what I'm going to use, and this is, you know, I assume this is what it is, and there was a conversation back and forth. This is where domain knowledge matters. You have to understand from somebody else who understands that data what it is. And in this case, the customer was actually quite knowledgeable on the technical side as well. That's not always the case. Sometimes that's a communication issue. But it turned out in this particular case, that wasn't actually uh, a data for fraud events. It was actually an ID for fraud analyst. It gave really odd results. And even though Ted had talked to the customer ahead, the, the things that he said, the way he communicated what he was doing, they didn't hear what he said. There was just a breakdown in communication. I use that as an example because even in a case like that, trying to do the right thing with people knowledgeable on both sides, communication can go awry. So it's really important to make use of that domain knowledge, absolutely verify, double check, find ways to have people say back to you what they think you just said to them to make sure that there's not a misunderstanding at that stage. Clear communication is absolutely essential. And this can, you, you can, I'm sure, have run into other examples where that's going to be the case. Now, I wanted to just give you a fun example as an analogy for this idea of exploring data and finding out what's in there. And you'll find sometimes that the value in data jumps out at you in ways that you didn't uh, expect. How many people in the room uh, have come from a place where in your native language, the word for T, starts with a T sound, something like T, T, T. A bunch of people here, okay. You're, you're the blue dot on the map. How many people here come from a part of the world <laughs> where T starts as, sounds like chai, ch, has a ch sound. Like, you're the red dot on the map. And it turns out when you look at this, you start to see a pattern without a whole lot of deep knowledge. You start to see a pattern of the distribution of the word T as T, or something like T, a T sound versus cha, it turns out that T came from China, it came from different roots and different cultures, and where it came by a, an overland route, it mostly moved through cultures that pronounce it as something related to chai. There were other sources of T in China, and a lot of these came early through uh, Dutch, uh, trading, it came through, through ocean routes, and those were distributed around these different coastal regions, and it came from a region of China where the word sounded more like a T sound and ended up going through Dutch and came out as the word T. Uh, there's a red dot out there, which is actually turns out to be Portugal, where T arrived by sea instead of by land, but oddly enough has a CH sound, it's kind of an outlier. I just thought this was a fun example. And even in this example, having observed something like that, it certainly doesn't prove that that's correct. You'd have to do a lot of digging, find out some background information, figure out if this apparent pattern is actually real. But just by visualizing data, just by some exploration, you start to see a trend. And you say, is that trend maybe worth exploring? And you will see the same thing is true in your own situations. This is a real-world example of where data exploration made a big difference. I'm sorry, this talk is going to lose about half of it or go over, but we'll just plow on and see what happens. Uh, this was a big European services provider. Can't say exactly which one or what kind of service. Uh, they were, had complaints of, uh, they were getting complaints of poor service, but when they went back into the data in the reports, they were looking at averages from 
you know, reporting, and the averages all looked good. They didn't see any problem at all, so they couldn't figure out why people felt like they were getting poor service because of poor response time. And so they came to, this is a MapR customer, they came to MapR, this looked like a really hard problem because the data just didn't seem to show what was going on. They were going to need some kind of complex machine learning analysis to find out what was the anomaly, what was the problem. And the person who did this, uh, who actually isn't a data scientist, it started with somebody just to examine the data in one of our excellent engineers in the UK, uh, jumped in first, he used Apache Drill, and he did what you should do first, which is just explore the data, to figure out, they told him what they, you know, the, the customer said this is what the data is, and he explored it, and he immediately found that there were a number of regions where the data had dropped completely. It simply wasn't being reported. And so what this company had done is they had been averaging the average of reports from areas where everything worked right, and surprisingly, that looked good. And the areas where there were dropped signals also dropped the reports. They weren't even showing up in the data. So rather than this being a hard problem and having to spend months you know, building an elaborate thing, he went back in about three, three days and said, I found the problem. This is what it is. You have dropped signals here. They didn't even need to do machine learning. Now, often this would still be the first step that you would do in a machine learning problem, but you can see how valuable that is to just examine what you have and see what pops out at you, and also you'll discover patterns uh, that you may want to make use of, and in many cases, it's not that rare, you find that you don't actually have to do machine learning at all. Let's go to the second topic, which is features. How do you build features? How do you know which features to build? Which ones are going to be valuable to you? Well, the first thing I want you to keep in mind, again, unlike a Kaggle contest, is that it's not just a matter of choosing between a collection of features that are offered to you, but in the real world, you're going to actually build those features. Now, at this moment, I expect somebody to jump in here, or at least in their mind, be asking, but what about deep learning? Deep learning is going to discover those features for you. And you're absolutely right. That is one of the aspects of what deep learning is doing. Deep learning isn't appropriate for every situation, and indeed it may be far more complex and sophisticated and advanced than what you need for a lot of situations. But it's also true that deep learning techniques don't always discover the features that you need. There are some situations where you need features that would never be discovered that way, and so it's just good to know both techniques and to realize that, this, that you have more than one option. So there is no specific right answer about what makes the right feature, and then we'll talk a little about how you develop the feature after you decide what is the right feature. It really is a trial and error, or I'll say a trial and success. Keep trying different things and see what works in order to find the winners. But there are some general areas, uh, kind of criteria to look for. Obviously, you want good performance in the model. Feasibility, and by that I mean, do you actually have the data you would need to build that feature? Do you have the right to use it? Do you have access to it? Uh, is it data that is going to be handled at a scale that will give you a response in the time that you need you know, for the practical applications? So always keep in mind your, your real-world SLAs as you build these things. So feasibility is a big thing. And the one I think that is most often overlooked, but you really hear this from people who have a lot of experience with real-world machine learning, is the interpretability of a feature. And this last one is a luxury. You don't always get to do that. But if you have a choice of features, and what I mean by interpretability is literally, can this feature be understood by a person who's a non-data scientist? And why is this important? Even is it easy to understand by other data scientists? It's important because it's easier to build consensus around the project you're building. It's easier to explain to people the results, what they're getting from this. It's easier to explain to somebody who's going to fund your project and give you the resources you need. Maybe you're trying to build some kind of a system to detect what happens for big telecommunication systems who's concerned about churn. They want to see what's leading up to churn. They have somebody in a call center who's going to act on these results or credit card fraud, you have somebody who's going to act on these results. Can you explain to somebody in a fraud center what these features and what this result means? And so if you have the choice to build features that are interpretable by humans, that's a huge advantage and a huge luxury. Doesn't mean you have to do that, but where you can do it, it can be really helpful. 
How do you decide what features you might want to look through? Well, one thing you can do is think through the behaviors of the thing you're studying. If you're building some kind of a system to do recommendation or to look at behaviors of people who are buying things online, Think about the steps that they might take right before they buy things. If it's a person who's about to leave a telecommunication system, what are some events that might happen right before that? Just literally put yourself in that place and think through it. And that will, it won't show you everything, but it'll put you on the right path to see what data you need, and then you can go find out if that data actually exists. Let's start with the example of credit card fraud, credit card fraud detection. And this is hilarious. I was going to look at you for the halfway point. <laughs> as we hit that slide. He says, go faster. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> in this case, you have to actually put yourself in the situation of being a fraudster yourself. What would you do if you were trying to steal things from people by stealing cards? Let's take a simple example. You've stolen a debit card. Uh, at least in the US, these debit cards work with a PIN number. That's a problem because you've got the card, but you don't know the PIN. So maybe a choice you make as a fraudster is you decide to use it as a credit card instead of a debit card. In the US, that switches and lets you do it by signature. The reason that's an advantage is it's easier to fake a signature than it is to fake a PIN number. Now, it doesn't mean that as a feature that you need to actually analyze whether that was an accurate signature or what signature it is. What you're looking for is a change in behavior from using PIN to using a signature. And this could be done for other reasons, like uh, intentionally damage the chip, so you have to use a mag strike, and that pushes you again towards signature. You think like the fraudster, what would they do? And this can leave clues that you can actually discover yourself. By the way, I wanted to tell you a joke, and I'm so late, I'm going to do it anyway. I, was, I picked William Shakespeare as my signature here because I was actually named after William Shakespeare. I mean, my name is Ellen, but I was named long after William Shakespeare lived. Okay, there you go. <laughs> That's your token joke. Uh, other behaviors that point to fraud is fraudsters take a card, they go out and do some small transactions or test probes to see if they're going to be able to do this before they really go, you know, for the big, big haul. Now, if we go to experts and they say, this often happens at a gas station because it's a small transaction, there's nobody there to actually observe what's going on and they can just drive away. And so we say, well, maybe we could use that and build features from that. How do I do that? I might build a risk table as a reference. That risk table could be used designed to look for probe events. I could design a separate risk table to look for the actual fraud event. And here is how that works. You want to generalize from what the expert says. They say gas station, you think merchant type, so you can make it a broader thing. They say just before you, a fraud happens, here's behavior, you say, let's look for different time windows of what just before means. You're going to compare those events for frauds and non-frauds. You're going to look at the relative uh, occurrence of those events. And for that, you're going to do a risk table that has a log of the ratio of the fraud counts to the non-fraud counts. You'll do that for different merchantites, and then you'll start to compare that back to individual windows. Here's an example. This is totally fake data. It's just made up, but it's typical of what you see. And I am going to go fast now, but what I want to call your attention to, we, we knew to look for gas stations. So that first line is gas stations, and you notice that the number of events there is roughly about 60,000 for fraud and non-fraud. That's surprising. But it's not surprising when you look at the number of samples. Obviously, there are a lot more non-fraud samples. And so the sample size is actually a, a 10x difference. That means the, the risk, the occurrence of this in fraud situations is about 10 times what it would be in non-fraud situations. That last column, your log risk ratio, is a pretty large positive number. That's an indicator. That's what you expect to see. Well, just look at tea room. Apparently, people don't go out and get tea right before they're going to commit a, a felony. That's what this tells us. You have a pretty small negative number, there, or a pretty large negative number. Jump down to the bottom, though. Pizza delivery is a surprise. You've got quite a positive number. Apparently, they do go out and get pizza. They just don't get tea with it. And why I wanted to show you this is this is something that you discover. It's not what the expert told you. The expert gave you a pointer in the direction to go. You expanded that, generalized it, began to actually explore the data, and this pops out. Maybe pizza delivery is also a feature you want to use and combine with others to look for probe events. And so how you would build this is now for an individual 
card, the set of uh, events for that card over a time window. I think this is about a day. You look this up in your risk table. You enter those numbers. You look at them collectively in some way. I think this time it was just a sum. But you're just trying to say over different windows for a particular card, for a particular set of events compared back to our risk table, how likely is it that fraud is happening on that credit card? Other things you can do is to augment data, add other data to the feature that you know. Maybe you know a merchant ID. You might look up the location of that and combine those, and that gives you an additional feature. Data transformation, which can be quite simple but hugely powerful. In this case, something as simple as taking the log of a value. You, it's also helpful to have some domain knowledge or common sense here. If you're looking at a two, or, two euro difference in transition, uh, tra two transactions, that two euro difference may make a lot more impact where you're going from 10 to 12 and 100 to 102. Small changes in the data gives you a more meaningful way to look for data, a look at data. Velocity is such a common feature, I just wanted to mention it itself, and especially if you think about things like credit card fraud, the geodistance or geolocation over time is a, is a velocity issue. If you go out and you buy a beer here in Berlin and 10 mil minutes later you buy a beautiful pearl necklace in Singapore, something's not right. Okay, so that's something you can look for. But expand that. Ask yourself how many different ways can you look at velocity. You might look at the number of events over time. You might look at the amount of spend over time. And you can think of other ones as well. So again, always expand the number of ways that you look at things, and that gives you a much stronger situation. Jumping into the third topic, we've talked about a lot of different ways that you make decisions about what feature to use, that you take data that experts gave you, but you examine it, you verify it, you do processing, you do transformations, you do augmentation, you build the features, you build your training set. That's a lot of work. And you've picked your algorithm, you've written the code for your model, you're going to go through the training process, you're going to have a trained model, you're going to deploy it into production. How do you know what you actually did? How can you go back later and know what you did? How do you know what you did with the code? How do you know why you did it? How do you know how you developed that training data? Why did you develop it? What data did it come from? What were the assumptions? Where is the training data now? Has somebody helpfully written over it and you can't go back to it? There's a great deal that you need to keep track of as we said, just to remind you, the data is a key part of this, and what I didn't mention before is oftentimes you actually do this for cross-validation in training where you take your training set and cut it different ways, and you're doing it over and over again just in a single round, basically, of training. You have a lot to keep track of. Go back to my slides. This is a really nice paper by Ted Dye, a very recent blog uh, post that explains a lot of this about the role of data in a model. What this would say is that data really makes the model. Here we go, a better version. If you have different training data, you have a different model. Can't emphasize this enough. We're not saying by training data, I use this, you know, a certain class of events to look at training. We mean literally the exact data that you use to train that model. And so you have versions of data just as you would have versions of code. If I ask you, is it OK for only one person to compile your production source code, you'd probably say, no, 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 no. OK, in this case, you'd be right. But exactly the same thing actually applies to data. You need ways to do data version control and to document the data source, where it's stored, be able to preserve it, just like you froze those, uh, you didn't, somebody froze those blood samples. You have to know what you did, where it is, how to go back to it, and you have to do this in such a way, it's like writing a note to your future self, okay? Could you come back to it six months or a year from now and be able to do it? Because you will want to, not only to tune and repeat a project you're working on, but because you're now working on something different and like the blood sample, you realize that there's valuable data, valuable features, maybe in the raw part of that project, uh, data, that you could now make use of. But the other reason is so that you can share this with other people on your team. This is important. It's writing notes to your future self, or it's writing notes to that person who gets hired when you get your big promotion and bumped up and somebody else comes in and starts working on your project. So it's really important to say this and document it. There are a number of ways to do it. This was just a 
reminder slide that you know that, that machine learning is an iterative process. It's not just a single thing. There are a number of different ways to do it. Notebooks are excellent. You can share code that way. You can document what you're doing. There are a lot of different choices of notebooks. These are two excellent ones. But think about what you do with code and think about how you do the analogous thing with data. It's completely familiar. You have a new person come in. They maybe fork off code. You maybe store what's going on in Git. That's all familiar to everybody here. But when you try to do the same thing with data, these training sets can be enormous. And so you have to find a tool that lets you do this effectively with data. You may be documenting what you do partly in that notebook, but where do you store the data itself? Where do you store the different versions of training data? Now, I work with people who work with Map Our Data Platform. It's a superb platform for doing machine learning, partly because it's a large-scale distributed platform, but unlike Hadoop-based systems, data is directly available to machine learning tools. You can use R, you can use Python, TensorFlow, MXNet, H2O, whatever you want directly on the data. You don't have to copy things in and out. But it's also very useful because MapR has something called MapR Volumes. And based on volumes, you make snapshots, real point-in-time, honest-to-God snapshots. They're cheap, they're easy to make, they don't use up a lot of storage space because they're just pointing back to original data. So this becomes just a superb tool for data versioning, and you can actually put a README file right there in the, the snapshot with the, the data, the training data or the raw data itself. You can also document that back in the notebook. It's really important to do multiple ways of documentation. This is a webinar. You'll have my slides. I recommend you go back to it. There's a Finnish uh, company that uh, does, builds machine learning pipelines as a tool, and they did a webinar and basically do a live demonstration showing how they architect their solutions and how they use snapshots to version data and what aspects of data versioning are important to them. It's a, it's a really nice short little uh, uh, video that you, sh you might want to take a look at. These are some of the things that you want to look at. I'm at the end of my time, I think. Should I talk for another minute or two? Yes, no, yes, okay. <laughs> These are some of the things that you want to document, and again, you know, go back to it. But keep in mind, what you document for training data is different than what you document for the code, the trained model, and how you got there. They're slightly different things, and you'll want to keep track of both of them, including the path name for the training snapshot itself, why you chose what you did, how you pick things like a random number generator to actually build in the learning process itself. Go back to this list, go back to that uh, uh, blog reference that I put up by Ted, and you'll see this explained in some detail. One last thing I wanted you to think about is a lot of people are used to the idea of unit testing when it comes to code. They don't think in those terms in terms of data. But that's really important. This is kind of a new thing for people to do. And what you're basically doing is, in addition to all the things that we just said, is design unit tests that are constantly testing to say, is what we're doing now what we were doing before? Has there been a change in data? And those unit tests can be designed to look at outputs from the machine learning model. And that's kind of cool, because some changes in input data happen, but they don't really matter. You don't have a substantial problem or difference in the output, and you don't have to waste time looking at those. You can just keep looking at outputs and say, are we still in a range that makes sense? And a different approach is to actually design unit test, data te training, te unit data tra testing that <laughs> Uh, that look at the input data, and you're actually looking for the changes before they go in. That's a very good way to do it, too. Uh, for doing that second one, there's an excellent Google paper on data validation, and I recommend you go to that link. But however you decide to do it or do it both ways, it, again, it's a step that's often overlooked, but it's really valuable. You catch things quickly as they begin to change, and they often do change. So these are a couple of books that uh, use related topics. Uh, they're available as a free download courtesy of MapR. Please continue to support women in big data. It's not just good for women, it's good for society. And 
from one woman in big data. Thanks, and also thank you very much for putting up with the, the anomaly with the slides right at the beginning. Thank you.